We're going to explore death and dying, hell and heaven, what happens when you die. And I have to tell you candidly, of all the messages that we've prepared over the last several decades, this is really the toughest for many reasons. It's a difficult topic. It's one that you can never completely get your arms around. It's one that is just plagued with myths and superstitions and met with trite cliches, what some people call Bible babble and so on. But we're going to try to get into this because it's unquestionably the most important topic we've ever addressed. And we're going to divide it in two parts. Our present reality first and the mystery of our destiny, what really happens when we die. One of the things that we're going to try to do is start with our conceptions, or I might even say misconceptions, about where we are today, our present physical reality. Because people ask me, is, is hell real? Part of that is determined by what you mean by real. There are key questions we'll try to address. What happens when you die? When you pass through that portal, what's the first thing you run into? Is there really an afterlife? Many people would deny that. And if so, what's heaven like? And perhaps even more disturbing, is there really a hell? We use that phrase so casually. We know all the superstitions and myths and literary conceptions, but is there really a reality that we call hell? To do this, though, to attack this problem, we have to really understand some other concepts that we also band, you know, band about pretty casually. The nature of eternity. We use that term. What does it really mean? And this reality that we find ourselves in, this physical world that we think we understand and yet discover we really don't. Although the lifestyles and values and self-perceptions of most adults have undergone significant changes and millions have embraced the postmodern worldview, it's interesting that the majority of adults continues to believe that there is life after death, that everyone has a soul, and that heaven and hell probably do exist. This may come as a surprise. That over yet, despite this, these traditional views that are surprisingly wildly, widely held, over 50 million Americans are uncertain about their personal fate. In terms of a belief in afterlife, 8 out of 10, according to recent research, as recently as September of 2003, 8 out of 10 believe in an afterlife of some sort. And a large majority agree that every person has a soul uh, that will live forever, either in God's presence or absence, an afterlife of some sort. About 9% uh, suggest that an afterlife may exist, but they're not certain. And one out of every 10 adults contend that there's no form of life after one dies on earth. So that's the breakdown. Rather surprising in some respects. 76% of the people canvassed believe that heaven exists. 46% would describe it as a state of eternal existence in God's presence. About 30% think of it as an actual place of rest and reward where souls go after death. There's about 14% that think it's just symbolic, about 5% that doesn't think there really is any such thing, and there's about 5% that feel just they're just not sure. But again, it's a surprising percentage. Now you get to the other side of it, about the same proportion of people, 71%, versus the 76% in heaven, believe that there is a hell. But there's no real dominant view. About uh, 4 out of 10 adults believe that hell is just a state of eternal separation from God's presence. And about 32%, say 1 in 3, feel it's an actual place of torment and suffering where people's souls go after death. About 13% just regard it as a symbol of some kind of bad outcome. And about 16% are not sure, really don't have a, a belief or don't believe in it at all. Interesting breakdown. In terms of anticipating a destination, nearly two-thirds of Americans believe that they will go to heaven. One in four admitted that they probably have no idea what happened after they die. Call it 24%. Less than half of 1% expect to go to hell. 5% uh, feel they just cease to exist at death, about one in 20. And about 5% believe that they're coming back in another life form. This view of uh, this uh, concept of reincarnation that pervades so much Eastern mysticism and the rest. 
That obviously is not a biblical concept, but when, <laughs> whenever I run into this issue of reincarnation around Halloween or whenever, I'm indebted to Gail Irwin, who called to my attention a poem that I can't resist inserting in this presentation. And uh, it's a poem by uh, Walt McRae. What is reincarnation? A cowboy asked his friend. It starts, his old pal told him, when your life comes to an end. They comb your hair, they wash your neck, they clean your fingernails, and they put you in a padded box away from life's travails. Now the box in you goes into the hole that's been dug into the ground. Reincarnation starts in when you're planted neath that mound. Them clods melt down just like the box in you who is inside. And that's when you begin your transformation ride. And in a while, the grass will grow up on your rendered mound. Till someday upon that spot, a lonely flower is found. Then a horse may wander by and graze upon that flower that once was you and now has become your vegetated bower. Now the flower the horse done eat along with his other feed makes bone and fat and muscle essential to the steed. But there's a part that he can't use, so it just passes through. And there it lies upon the ground, this thing that once was you. And if perchance I should pass by and see this on the ground, I'll stop a while and ponder at this object that I found. And I'll think about reincarnation and life and death and such. But I'll come away concluding why you ain't changed all that much. <laughs> okay, I just, I, uh, at the chagrin of my staff, I had to include that just for a light thing. I got that from Gail Irwin at a men's conference who apparently we tracked it down at so. Wallace McRae did a series of cowboy poems, that's one of them. But getting more serious about it, there are people that really take reincarnation seriously, and it's not a biblical concept. But of this whole survey, it's interesting that less than 1%, about half of 1% of people feel that they may indeed uh, enter, enter hell. It's obviously not, a, it's, it's, uh, not surprising, yet it's tragic, especially since Jesus Christ spoke more about hell than he did heaven. And the Creator Himself entered our creation, became a man, to deliver us from that terrifying jeopardy that we all face. Now, of those that believe they're heaven-bound, it's interesting, too, that they feel they're going heaven-bound because 43% felt they can be going to heaven because they confessed their sins and accepted Christ as their Savior. Fair enough. About 15% feel they've tried to obey the Ten Commandments. Whoops. And 15% feel they're going to heaven because they're basically a good person. That's a widespread assumption. 6% believe they're going to heaven because God loves all people and will not let them perish. So it's interesting, about 43% have a biblical view and the others, of course, have, have some confusion on this whole topic. What's interesting about the research, this is all Barna uh, Research Group in Ventura, California, pulled this together. A lot of the findings are quite self-contradictory. Among born-again Christians, 10% believe that people are reincarnated after death. Isn't that confusing? 29% claim it's possible to communicate with the dead, even though necromancy, of course, is uh, strongly forbidden in the, in the Bible. 50% contend that a person can earn their salvation based on good works. There again, they haven't done their homework. And many believe that there are multiple options for gaining entry into heaven. So these contradictions um, prevail throughout the survey. Uh, many have redefined grace to mean that God is so eager to save people from hell that he will change his nature and universal principles for their own individual benefit. That's basically uh, what they uh, are assuming. And it's interesting that not only Christians are confused, obviously atheists and agnostics are also confused. 50% admit in the questions that every person has a soul, heaven and hell exist, and there is life after death. It's a strange view to emerge out of those that would be normally defined as atheists and agnostics. 12% admit that believing and accepting Jesus Christ probably makes life after death possible. And so the labels obviously are not descriptive. And obviously many people who identify themselves in one way are really, they evidence um, the adoption of very simplistic views from novels and entertainment, movies, that sort of thing. Very superficial. You know, that's really tragic because, you know, if you and I we're traveling to a foreign country. Our desk would be littered with brochures and background on those countries, especially if we were not just visiting, but say moving there on a career change for a period of time. We would really study that destination, know a lot about it. Well, all of us are going to cross a threshold into a whole nother adventure 
And we haven't, in general, taken the trouble to investigate what we really know about what's coming. So one of the things that we're going to try to do, first of all, we're going to try to shed the baggage of our misconceptions and presumptions on this topic. We're going to explore a little bit about the role of the creation and our conceptions of reality that underlie this whole discussion. We'll talk about the fact we now know, 20th century, the great discovery of 20th century science is that our universe is finite, it's not infinite. We're going to talk a little bit about the nature of time because that undergirds any concept of philosophy, any concept of eternity, all these things suffer from our misconceptions about the nature of time itself. We're going to talk a little bit about the nature of our, what we call reality. What do we mean by hyperspaces? We'll talk a little bit about the insights we get from the paradoxes of quantum physics. And much of this material may be familiar to some of our regulars because we, of course, uh, have adopted much of this material in our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours products and some of our other briefings. But we wanted this message to stand on its own, so I'm going to indulge in a little review of some of these fundamental things that undergird our studies here. But let's talk a little bit about avoiding truth. You know, there is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. When Edmund Spencer is famous for that particular quote. You'll find the equivalent in the Bible in Proverbs 18.13. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. So what I'm going to ask you to do is try to set aside the presumptions and, and uh, uh, presuppositions that we have on these topics, because we all have them. Let's try to set those aside and try to explore this difficult subject with an open mind. So we'll do it in two parts. This first part is our present reality, and we'll do a second session following this called The Mystery of Our Destiny. But let's get some background on our present reality in front of us first. Before we start any further, though, I want to underscore the whole approach of our ministry. It's based on, obviously, a biblical position. And biblical skepticism has been popular in the past because of doubts about the historicity of the patriarchal accounts, about the denial of even having writing in Moses' day and the Gospels and Epistles being the second century after the fact and so forth. The good news is most of these have been debunked. It's now refuted by archaeological discoveries, documentary discoveries, and competent analysis. So you and I can take the position that most people who hold these peculiar skeptical views are simply uninformed in terms of modern discoveries. Our ministry is based on two primary discoveries. The first is that we have 66 books that we glibly call the Bible, even though they were penned by over 40 different guys over virtually 2,000 years. It's an integrated message, and not simply thematically. Every number, every place name, every detail is there by skillful engineering. And once you discover that for yourself, it opens up a whole different perspective of what we call the Word of God. And the second discovery derives from that. If it's an integrated message, even though we have 66 separate books, 40 different guys over thousands of years that penned it, its origin, we can demonstrate, had to come from outside our dimensionality of time. And once you discover that for yourself, it'll change your whole perspective of the Bible. And it certainly is essential for the topics that we're going to be exploring in this session. So let's start a little bit with exploring this whole peculiar thing we call time. And uh, there's an atomic clock located at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado. And there's an identical clock, atomic clock, located at uh, Greenwich, at the Royal Observatory in uh, Greenwich, England. Now, these clocks are accurate to better than one second per million years. And I'm always reminded at the time when I, had the, I was on the board of a company that was acquiring a frequency time system company in uh, Boston. And the president came to our board meeting, very proud of the, of the product, which is primarily these cesium clocks that are accurate to better than a second in a million years. And I raised my hand as a director of the acquiring company, saying, I only have two questions. How do you know? <laughs> and, and who cares? You know. Well, the way you know is from the, resident, the properties of the cesium atom, frankly. But the, who cares? It turns out that your accuracy of time measurement determines the precision of your navigation. And these devices, of course, is, are the things that make the global positioning satellite system uh, so, uh, so accurate and so useful. But the, this, it's interesting that these clocks are that precise. Now, one of the questions, see the natural, it's all based on the, the natural resonance of the cesium atom. That's what gives them the precision here. But the point is, these clocks, one in Greenwich, England, one in, in, uh, in Boulder, are accurate to better than one second every uh, million years. And yet, the one at Boulder 
ticks, in effect, five millionths of a second every year faster than the identical clock at Greenwich. Which one's correct? Not a big deal, but measurable and predictable. Turns out they're both correct. And uh, the one at Boulder is at 5,400 feet altitude, and the one at uh, Greenwich, England is at 80 feet above sea level. And so the difference in altitude makes the gravity slightly different, and that's part of the discovery. That's part of what I'm trying to get across. We know today that time is a physical property. If I had an atomic clock here on the platform and I raised it one meter, it would speed up by one part in 10 to the 16th. Not a big deal, but it is predictable and it is measurable. And so, not enough to change your schedules, but profoundly significant understanding the nature of time. Let me give you some other examples. They actually put atomic clocks on an aircraft going around the world eastward, and it lost point about 59 nanoseconds. And it, they put one on a clock going around westward, and compared to a, a one at stationary at the observatory, it gained 273 nanoseconds. Not a big deal, but it was predictable and measured, and it confirmed Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now, if you read up about this in, say, a physics textbook, they'll usually talk about two hypothetical astronauts. These guys, theoretically, born at the same instant. One we're going to leave here, and one we're going to send to the nearest star. Now, if you go to the night sky, our closest star is Alpha Centauri. It's about four and a half light years away. And in our imaginary experiment here, we're going to send one of these twin brothers to that star at, say, at half the speed of light and back. Well, if, the, if it's four and a half light years away and we're going to send them at half the speed of light, it'll take them nine years to get there and nine years back on our clock. That's on the Earth, about Earth time. On the clock that he's carrying with him, that's a different thing altogether. And there is some, I won't go through the math, the Lorentz transformations apply here, and as you apply those, it turns out that on his clock, the 18 years, the nine years there and nine years back, will take place in 15 years and seven months. He will return to the Earth two years and five months younger than his twin brother. And if that doesn't bother you, you weren't listening carefully. See, his time will be different than the time we have due to the fact the accelerations and so forth and the velocities involved here. So the main point here, and to dramatize this just a little bit further, let's imagine that we could send him almost at the speed of light. Let's assume we send him at 99.99% of the speed of light. So let's assume we could do that. Then it would be nine years round trip, four and a half there, four and a half back on our clock here on the Earth. But on his clock, it would be 33 days. So certainly the first thing he wants to do is invest carefully in his stock portfolio before leaving. But in any case, Einstein created a revolution, starting with a special theory of relativity in 1905, in which mass, velocity, and so forth was relative to the observer. But the more important one was his general theory of relativity in 1915. And why that's important to you and me is because he, he recognized that you and I don't live in just three dimensions. He recognized that there's a fourth dimension, that Planck's constant is really a four-dimensional constant. He recognized that there's no distinction between time and space. You and I live in a four-dimensional, or more, continuum. And this is no longer a theory. It's been uh, confirmed in 14 different ways to 19 decimal places. So the, Einstein, the general theory of relativity is a very, very fundamental insight. But the reason it's important for you and I is we need to understand that time is a physical property. It's not uniform. It varies with mass, acceleration, or gravity, among other things. We, you and I, live in, in uh, more than four dimensions, actually. Actually, we know now that we probably live in about ten. But I'll come back to that. See, the reason we have some misconceptions, when we were in school, the teacher would go to the blackboard and draw a line from left to right. And uh, the left end would be the beginning of something, the birth of a famous person or the founding of an empire. The right end of that line would be the end of the death of that person or the, the falling of that empire. And uh, all of us have made timelines in school. So when we encounter the concept of eternity, we tend to presume it's sort of like a line. It starts at infinity on the left and goes to infinity on the right. We think of eternity as simply having lots of time, an unlimited amount of time. And that makes colorful poetry. It's one of our verses in our hymns, An Amazing Grace, uh, tends to presume that in effect. But let's ask ourselves a few questions. Let's talk about God. Is God subject to the restrictions of mass, acceleration, or gravity? Hardly. So God is not somebody who has lots of time. He is one who is outside the restrictions of time altogether. And that's exactly what Isaiah tells us. 
that thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Now, if he has the technology to create us in the first place, he has the technology to get a message to us. The question is, how does he authenticate his message? How does he let us know the message we receive is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or some kind of a fraud? One way he authenticates it is to rely on an attribute that's unique to him, that he's outside the dimensionality of time. And so that's exactly what Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 46, verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. God authenticates his message, among other things, by writing history before it happens, demonstrating that the origin is from outside time. So let's talk a little bit what I'll call the geometry of eternity. We've talked about, I've used a line horizontally in two dimensions here, but let, imagine this line that I'm showing on the screen is coming out at you in a third dimension. And behind, in, in the back part of the line is the past, where we are, we'll call it the present, and what's ahead of us is the future. For us, life and time is a sequence of events from the past through the present to the future. But for someone who's outside the dimensionality of that timeline, say in what we call eternity, from that vantage point, they can see the past, the present, the future simultaneously. We can't imagine that because we are limited in our thinking to what this, the dimensionality that we're constrained to. But someone that is outside the dimensionality, that's no problem. Let me give you a, 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 something you might be able to visualize. Imagine you're sitting on a curb watching a parade. Around the corner comes the marching units, the bands, the troops, whatever. And as they, as they come by, for you, the parade is a sequence of events. They come around this corner, they go down the street, they go on down that way. For someone who's outside the plane of that existence, say in a helicopter above the parade, they can see the staging area where the units are forming up. They can watch the parade as it you know, snakes through the city that it's going in, and they can also see where it's disbanded, going back to storage or whatever. So they can see simultaneously the beginning, what's happening, and the end from, from their vantage point. It's a, perhaps a clumsy analogy, but it gets across the idea that another dimension adds all kinds of capabilities. You know, Albert Einstein, my favorite quote of Dr. Einstein is that people like us, he says, who believe in physics, know that the distinction between the past, the present, and the future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. So he recognized that time is a uniqueness to our particular predicament in the reality that we find ourselves. So I want to talk a little bit more about the fabric of our universe. We take this also for granted. We know that the universe is not infinite. Why? Well, for lots of reasons. We know from thermodynamics, heat always flows from hot bodies to cold bodies. If the universe was infinitely old, it would be at a uniform temperature. It's not. It's still cooling down. So it, it had a beginning and it'll have an end. That's provable thermodynamically. So it's not infinitely old. It had a beginning and also it's destined for an ending. And we know that just from the laws of science. But another concept that has shattered most classical physicists is the discovery that the speed of light is not a constant. That's been a dictum of the physics world for many, many years. Back in the 17th century, uh, Kepler, Rene Descartes, and others all believed that light was instantaneous, or putting another way, had an infinite speed. That was the common presumption. But in 1677, a Dutchman by the name of Olaf Romer, me by measuring the uh, eclipses of one of Jupiter's satellites, when it's far away in its orbit and when it's closer, could compare that and get a measure of the speed of light. And he figured that out and he discovered that the speed of light was finite, roughly about 300,000 uh, uh, kilometers per second. The physics world never accepted that. For over 50 years, they clung to the presumption that it was infinite until an Englishman, James Bradley, 1729, confirmed Romer's work. And that's when they began to reluctantly recognize the speed of light was measurable and finite. For over three, in over 300 years, the speed of light has been measured 164 times by 16 different methods. And up until a few years ago, we took a lot of abuse from some of our friends in classical physics because we recognized the work of Barry Sutterfield and Trevor Norman, who had been suggesting the speed of light's not a constant. And uh, the Sutterfield and Norman uh, over the last 15 years, they started to compare all the experiments that have been done through the years on measuring the speed of light, and they discovered some interesting things. 
Romer's original data suggested the speed of light was 307, 600,000 kilometers per second with a range of plus or minus 5,400 kilometers per second. Not bad for the 17th century technology. In 1875, Harvard repeated the same thing, got a slightly different number, 299, 921. The range of error was way down, now from, not from 5,400 5, kilometers, but down to 13 kilometers because technology is improving through the time. We get to 1983, the National Bureau of Standards using a laser again measured the speed of light, and by now, the technology is such that our, the range of error is very, very small. But what's bizarre is look at the means. Romer's mean was 307,000 kilometers per second. Harvard was less, 299. National Bureau of Standards, again, slightly. What's, what's interesting, and these are just three data points, there's actually hundreds, but they all show the mean getting smaller through uh, through the speed slowing down through time. The idea that the speed of light is not a constant shatters the conception of most classical physics because that affects the atomic behavior. It affects, it goes through our whole physical universe. But to, up until about two years ago, this was highly controversial. When we published articles in our news journal, we got a lot of uh, uh, chuckles from some people. In the last two years, there have been increasing articles in the reputable scientific journals recognizing the speed of light is not a constant. And uh, so... In 1967, they changed the definition of a second, by the way. Previously, it was defined in terms of an orbit around the sun, and at that time, they changed it to, a, uh, to atomic time. But uh, that's, uh, uh, that's why, from that day on, it's kind of, you have to be more clever as to how you measure these things. But it turns out that atomic clocks and the orbital movements are no longer in sync. If the atomic clocks are correct, then the orbital speeds of Mercury, Venus, and Mars are increasing, which is impossible to take energy. See, if the gravitational constant is truly a constant, then the atomic vibrations and the speed of light have been decreasing. And that's the discovery that uh, Tom Van Flanderen at the U.S. Naval Observatory has been publishing for some time, and it's creating, there's a whole stir in the whole field of physics. The orbital clocks, uh, were, if, they, if they're favored, uh, then the planet's orbital speed is increased, it would violate the law of conservation of energy. If the atomic clocks are correct, that implies that uh, the uh, gravitational constant should change. Of course, it hasn't. So, Now, there's another thing going on that also is shattering our concept of reality. And that's this whole issue of the red shift. Most of you that know anything about astronomy are familiar with the fact that stars have their spectrum slightly shifted to the red. They call it the red shift. Edwin Hubble, back in the 20s, postulated that that shift is due to the fact that these stars are moving away from us. So the whole concept of the expanding universe hangs on the fact of this red shift. The further away the star is, the more it seems to shift to the red. Well, that all sounds pretty good, except there's a couple of guys over the last couple of decades, Halton Arp in Germany and William Tift in the University of Arizona, have been collecting information, carefully collecting red shift information. And they discover some bizarre things, not the least of which is that the shift, the red, is always in a digital step. That is, there's a number that's it's a multiple, always a multiple of. It's, it's not variable, it's a multiple of a number. In other words, quantized. And that, that shatters any attempt to explain why it shifted to the red. It can't be a Doppler effect, it can't be the expansion thing. This quantization of the red shift data may be evidence, strange enough, that there's a basic change going on in the property of space itself, it's an atomic effect rather than a recessional velocity effect. Now, the curve that's implied by all this, uh, uh, Alan Montgomery in Canada, statistician, carefully has analyzed this and gets a 95% correlation with a cosecant squared curve, which says, in effect, that backtracking from what we know today, the speed of light apparently was about 10 to 30% faster in the time of Christ, about twice as fast in the days of Solomon, about four times as fast the days of Abraham, and maybe as much as 10 million times as fast prior to 3000 BC. And uh, this, so this is beginning to shatter our concepts of this thing we call reality and the age of our universe, etc. But let's just, leaving, just let's, for our purposes, we just want to have some caution here about the presumptions we make about the universe, because the whole field of physics and cosmology and astrophysics has got the rug pulled out from under it. It's interesting, let's talk about this business of stretching the heavens. That's the expression you see all through the scripture. Let's talk about the fabric of, is this, the fabric of space. Is this just a metaphor? In Job 9.8, it speaks of God who alone stretches out the heavens. In Psalm 104, stretching out the heaven like a tent curtain. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 40. 
He has stretched out the heavens, Jeremiah 10. Notice how all through the scripture you find this strange expression about space. The Lord who stretches out the heavens in Zechariah 12. In fact, there are 17 passages that use this very directly and others that even infer it in other ways, more indirectly. Space, we know today, is not an empty vacuum. You and I tend to imagine that that space out there between the stars or whatever is empty. That it's an empty vacuum. We speak of the empty vacuum of space. Well, the Bible says it can be torn, Isaiah 64. It can be worn out like a garment, according to Psalm 102. It can be shaken, according to Hebrews 12, Haggai 2, and Isaiah 13. It can be burnt up, Peter warns us in 2 Peter 3. It can be split apart like a scroll, according to Revelation 6. It can be rolled up like a mantle or a scroll in Hebrews 1 and Isaiah 34. Now today we know that space has properties. We know today that if you take a cubic centimeter of empty vacuum of space, cool it down to absolute zero, they call that the zero point, there, it still retains as much energy as a hundred million suns. There's a residual energy there. In fact, that energy seems to explain why electrons don't spiral into the nucleus. It's sustained by that energy base. We know that property space has a dielectric constant, a permittivity, if you will, a permeability, that's a magnetic constant. It has an intrinsic impedance. Every radio ham who's tuned to an antenna knows that the impedance of space is about 377 ohms. It, in other words, it has physical properties. And the velocity of light at creation was probably two to the tenth uh, two and a half times to ten to the tenth times its present velocity, and, which is probably the, the present speed of, the gra of gravity. But the point is, space has properties. You and I don't think of it that way. And uh, now, space can be rolled up according to the Bible. So, if it can be rolled up, there must be some additional dimension that can be rolled up. And if I have a, a two dimensional piece of paper, to roll it up into a scroll it takes a third dimension. To be able to roll it up requires an additional dimension that's more than just intrinsic. See, if it can be, if it can be, there must be some dimension in which it can be thin. There must be some dimension into which it can be bent, you see. And so in order to, how, to be bent toward and so forth. So th these are hints already in the scripture that there are additional dimensions to the dimensions we think of. We think of three dimensions because we're used to a three-dimensional space. But we know from the scripture and now from quantum physics that space has more than three dimensions. So we're moving suddenly into this area of hyperdimensions. You say, what's this got to do with the subject? You'll see. Because I think this whole area of what we're talking about is our portal from leaving this temporary reality that we find ourselves in. We're going to go into hyperdimensions. Now, most of us have been trained, whether we realize it or not, in what's called Euclidean geometry. And we're going to go beyond Euclid. To be more than, anything with more than three dimensions is called a hyper hyperdimension. The most important lecture in mathematics was given on June 10th of 1854 by George Riemann when he, he developed a thing called metric tensors. And uh, it, uh, I, it took 60 years for Einstein to take that mathematics and develop his theory of relativity. He went to his death, Einstein went to his death frustrated because he couldn't reconcile the next step. If he'd gone to five or six dimensions, he went to four and solved his problem. If he'd gone to five or six, he would have resolved those things that frustrated him to his death. Now, the current thinking, of course, is that you and I live in not, not four, not five, six, but in ten dimensions. And uh, Einstein uh, you know, developed his theory of relativity, which basically recognized a four-dimensional space-time. In 53, Kaluza and Klein conspired to develop uh, uh, more than four dimensions to reconcile light and supergravity. And then Yang Mills in 63 developed the electromagnetic and be, were able to reconcile both nuclear forces. In 1984 and following, the current thinking in physics is what they call superstrings, one-dimensional strings that vibrate in ten dimensions. Now, to you and I, that doesn't make much sense, but I'll tell you what's interesting is that if you go back and study the writings of Nachmanides, he's one of the two most venerated Hebrew sages of the 12th century, and or actually 13th century, um, he concluded by studying Genesis chapter 1 that we live in ten dimensions. Four of them are directly knowable and six are not, according to his thing. He published this in his commentary on Genesis. And I find this fascinating because you and I uh, live in a culture where we spent millions of dollars building atomic accelerators to discover that we live in ten dimensions. Four are directly measurable, three spatial plus time, and the six are not directly accessible because they're smaller than the wavelength of light. So they're only inferable by indirect means, but 
well confirmed, it seems. Now, as we go into the scripture, I have to share this with you. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul writes, That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Most of us read that in Ephesians chapter 3. We may miss something subtle here. You notice what he said? Paul says the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. How many are there? Four dimensions. And one of the, word, the, the Greek word for length is a measurement of time, by the way. So I think that's fascinating. Did, did Paul really know we live in a four-dimensional space? Or is this just the Holy Spirit editing in his style? Don't know. But we are, really have encountered the boundaries of reality. There are two concepts that you and I talk about in mathematics that are not available in the physical world. They're elusive. The first is randomness. We talk about randomness. We talk about chance. But in modern science, there's a whole emergent field in mathematics called the theory of chaos because they've discovered most of us have been trained in mathematics in what's called deterministic mathematics. Two plus two equals four. Always. Always. Two plus two is four. Period. End of discussion. That's deterministic. Most engineering equations are deterministic. There's another field of mathematics called stochastic processes or random processes where the numbers represent distributions. Approximately two and approximately two is approximately four. With what range? Depends what the mean and variances are. So you suddenly get into populations. And that there's a whole field of advanced statistics that deal with, that, that are impacted by apparent randomness. But we discover we can't really create randomness. In a computer, you have a random number generator, but if you're, if you're a professional, you know it's not a real random number, it's a pseudo-random number. There's a generator that will generate numbers that have all the properties they can manage that they're approximately random, but they're not truly random. And we discover as you get into this, conceptually, they can't create a truly chance event. And they call that theory, that whole area of mathematics, chaos theory. It's a, it's a, front, it's a frontier of mathematics. What most people don't realize is the very existence of that theory of mathematics pulls the rug out from under evolution. Because there is no such thing as chance. There is no such thing as chance. But in, this is what the, the scripture says in the first place. The lot is, in the, is cast in the lap, but the whole disposing there is of the Lord. Einstein said the same thing. He's, he's very, one of his famous quotes is, Albert Einstein says, God does not play dice. That was his frustration with quantum physics as it was emerging. God does not play dice. Do you know why? If he did, he'd win. <laughs> there is no such thing as chance. That the, the, these, th these, the, these things would appear around us are not. Well, there's another concept that we do not find in the physical universe. That's infinity. In the macrocosm, the universe is not infinite. It has a limit. They've discovered that in the 20th century. It's the macrocosm. But there's also something even more disturbing, and that's at the microcosm. If I have a line and I cut it in half... You would think that I could take whatever's left and cut it in half. And indeed, I could. And whatever's left there, I could cut it in half again. I could do it again and again and again. Always, whatever I had left, I could cut in half. You would think, instinctively, at least theoretically, that I could do that forever. It turns out, when I get down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, if I try to cut that in half, it ceases to have locality. What remains is everywhere at once. It has a property that the physicists called non-locality. Subatomic particles, we know today, have, no, do, have a property called non-locality. And that's disturbing. They've discovered that all photons in the universe know what all the other photons are doing. They're intrinsically connected some way. And uh, these concepts, the more you know about quantum physics, the more disturbing it is. There's a, length, uh, there's a Planck length of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. There's a period of time, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. You can't get a period of time shorter than that. So we discover that we, the universe as we know it is a digital simulation. The implications that are shattering. Boltzmann, one of the great uh, atomic scientists that got into it, was at the frontier of quantum physics as it emerged, committed suicide as he realized the implications. He could not... Recognize, reconcile this. We are in a digital simulation. So the reality, the thing we call reality, is actually a virtual reality. We do that with games and stuff, and they're getting more and more sophisticated. There's even some science fiction stories where the, the people create a virtual world with virtual people and so forth. We can begin to understand what we mean by virtual reality. The, re, the reality we're in is a virtual reality, in effect.
In fact, uh, David Bohm, who's one of Einstein's uh, associates, when he discovered holography, was thrilled because he suddenly realized here's a model that seems to fit the universe. He thinks the entire, he, he has this view that all the world that we know is what he calls the explicate order. Uh, it's enfolded, that it's a tangible everyday physical reality. But there's an implicate, larger, if you will, order, a more primary, deeper underlying reality that he calls the implicate order. You say, well, he's some kind of fringe guy. No. Uh, he has sympathetic report from people like Roger Penrose of Oxford. He's the creator of the modern theory of black holes. Bernard Espinat, which is of the University of Paris. He's one of the leading authorities at uh, the foundations of quantum theory. And Brian Josephson. If you've been in semiconductors, uh, you know what a Josephson junction is. Brian Josephson got the Nobel Prize in 1973 in physics, the University of Cambridge. These guys believe that David Bohm is on the right track, that our universe is not only a simulation, it's, it's, a, it's, like, it's like a super hologram. But, you know, it's interesting, as we look at the scripture, 2 Corinthians 4.18, Paul says, we, know, we look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This is one of thousands of verses we could pick from the Bible, which has always spoken of a broader, more serious, more permanent reality that we call, glibly, the spiritual world. It's the real world. What we are in is a special subset of that that's been established for certain purposes. In Romans chapter 1, Paul writes, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It's interesting, we could take dozens of verses which point out that God holds all people accountable to know who he is, if no other way, by the creation itself. And uh, so he goes on, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And it goes on to describe the results of all of that. Now, you and I live in a culture that is permeated with a mythology of evolution. And I don't mean micro, little adaptations. We're, not talking, we're talking about biogenesis, that life just happened. And... Uh, you know, it's interesting that that per pervades not just our science textbooks in our schools, it, per it pervades our uh, fields of psychology, fields of law. Our whole culture is, takes for granted this premise of evolution. And it's strange, we live at a time where evolution is recognized by the leading scientists as no longer a viable explanation. We live in an era that could be called the death of Darwinism. Advances in microbiology, the DNA, all these have dealt a death blow to Darwinism. Why? Because DNA is a digital code, a three out of four error correcting code. And the implications of that are shattering because there's no way it could have happened by chance. It is very skillfully designed. Darwinism cannot explain the origin of life because it cannot explain the origin of information. And, uh, and uh, the whole concept of irreducible complexity, which is now understood in design, refutes chance as a, as a designer. There's a very fundamental insight. Clearly, you and I are the products of design. And if by design, then there must be a designer. And if there's a designer, he has a purpose and an accountability, and we have, to which we have an accountability. And that's why it's a basic premise of the present scientific establishment is to, to search for explanations that deny a designer. They're no longer engaged in a pursuit of truth. They're engaged in pursuit of explanations that have a mechanistic uh, result. Well, that's, that's a quick survey of the, 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 the shaky foundations of reality that we call reality. Let's shift now to ourselves. Let's talk a little bit about the architecture of ourselves. Most of us have seen pictures in a doctor's office or in a textbook of our anatomy. Our, tissue, our organs and tissues and so forth. That's just the, the, what I'll call the hardware environment. You know, in the scripture, we have words for the body, soul, and spirit. The trifold nature of man pervades the scripture from end to end. And uh, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, we have the word nefesh, uh, which is uh, used many ways, but it, it very close to what we would call the soul. And also ruach, which is the, the, uh, uh, the spirit. And there are various words for the body, depending on which part of the body you're talking about. The word nefesh can mean soul, self. It also can be used for life, creature, person, appetite, mind, living being. It also can allude to desire, emotion, passion. It's translated 
out of 751 occurrences, 575 times it's translated soul. So it's, it's close to what you and I think of in the English word as soul. There are places where it's used as a figure of speech, meaning life itself. 29 places. There's a number of, it can mean person, mind, heart, creature, body, uh, and so forth. It can be used as a figure of speech, what's called in rhetoric a synecdoche, where you take the specific for the general and the general for the specific. It's like saying uh, uh, the ship went down with 17 souls aboard. Well, we don't mean just the souls. They drown. I mean, every, we use that term. That's called a synecdoche. We're using that term for the, the total. And, or I'll say, lend me a hand. Well, I don't want just your hand. I'd like your whole body to come help me move this cart or, or something. See, so these are synecdoches. I don't mean this hand. That's just, I'm using the specific to imply the general. And the word nefesh, of course, is used that way too. It can be used three different ways. The physical life, it's 150 times in the Old Testament, just means the physical life. Adam's body was complete, yet unanimated, until God placed in it the spirit of life in Genesis 2.7. A second way it's used is figurative, as a synecdoche for the whole person. So I just use the example. A ship going down with, you know, uh, 200 nefeshes aboard, say, souls aboard. But the intent way, the dominant way, is, the, is, is used as what you and I would call the soul, the inner being, that transcendent self that departs at death and returns with life at the resurrection. And that's all in Genesis all the way through the Old Testament. It also refers to that which is attributed to reason, emotion, will, worship, those qualities of a person that distinguish them, I'm say, from an animal. So this is, these are just extracts from the, one of the primary Hebrew lexicons, Brown, uh, Driver, and Briggs. Now, in the rabbinic literature, it's clear that Nefesh was understood that the soul was to be invisible and immortal. That was a rabbinical concept. Even in Josephus, he points out that all Jews except the Sadducees believed in the immortality of the soul, or the Nefesh. And Eusebius, and the, er, er, also the doctrine of soul sleep, was invented in the third century. But, uh, the, so these, th these other ideas came later. There's another term that's a troublesome term in a sense, that's the word ruach which can mean breath or wind. It's also used for God, God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's occasionally used meaning angels, both good and evil. It's used of life in men. It's sometimes used of disembodied spirits, both good and bad. Uh, disposition or attitude, he's had a, he has a mean spirit, that sort of thing. And uh, it's also used for the seat of the emotion and the will. So there's an overlap between Ruach and Nefesh in some usages. And uh, it's translated spirit... Uh, in the holy or general sense, 232 times. It's translated wind 92 times. So it's an, there's, you see it's got two different meanings, but they're very, they're, they're, in a semantic sense, they're very close. The breath, 27, and it's mentioned some other things, a relatively trivial number of times. The Greek term that's sort of like that is, suki, like, like Nefesh, is suki. Uh, in the Septuagint, that's the translation from the Old Testament, the Old Testament translation into Greek. Suki is, it translates the word nefesh, 785 out of 810 cases. So suki is, is, is uh, the word from which psychology comes, if you will. And so uh, the psyche and the nefesh are close cousins, if you will. It's interesting that never in the Greek do they use bios, the Greek word for physical life, to be the equivalent of nefesh. So nefesh clearly is... Uh, that w was seen as that which is the soul, okay? So it, it, it deliberately, the, the translators deliberately avoid equating the soul with mere physical life. This is very important we could, to understand here. And of course, I mentioned that psyche is where, psyche is where the uh, word psychology is derived. So in the, we have in the Greek, pneuma, psyche, and soma. Pneuma being the air, is one word to get, get the word pneumatics, psyche and soul. And uh, the word uh, psyche means breath, breath of life, just like ruach does pretty much. Uh, all its usage, it, it's used for soul 58 times out of 105. Life in general, 40 times and a few other uses. The word pneuma is used of the movement of air or wind. It's a breath of nostrils and so forth. It's the word from which we get the word pneumatics, air-driven tools and so forth. But it's also used in the Greek to be the spirit, that vital principle by which the body is animated, the rational spirit, the power by which human being feels and thinks and decides, that is the soul. It also is used as a spirit or a, 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 some kind of essence, devoid of all matter, but possessing, being sentient, knowing the power of knowing, desiring, and uh, deciding and acting and so forth. It's used of a term, a spirit higher than man but lower than God, like, in other words, angels and so forth. 
And it's also a term used in a, in a proper name sense of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, it's, it's a neuter name on the one hand, but it's used as a person, a masculine person in the grammar. So the word pneuma, out of 385 times, is usually a spirit or Holy Ghost or spirit of Christ, or the human spirit, the dominant use of it uh, in, in the biblical text. So we've had the word nefesh in the Hebrew. The word psyche in the Greek is not exactly the same, but very close. And we have ruach and pneuma, pneuma in the Greek and ruach in the Hebrew, not exactly the same. And what's interesting, some people stumble by picking an example of a verse which is using it as a figure of speech in that area where there is not overlap and try to build doctrine from it. That obviously is, is not competent exegesis. And of course, the soma is the Greek word for body, and there's several words in the Hebrew that are used. Now, in the English, of course, we have body, soul, and spirit that approximate these terms very closely, but not precisely. Okay? We together? Now, as we look at body, soul, and spirit, we have the tripart part of man. But I want to change subjects a little bit here because I think this is useful. I found it as I travel a very useful insight. And uh, I have up here on the, the uh, platform a computer. If you knew everything there is to know about every piece of hardware inside that machine, every circuit, every microcircuit, every transistor, every capacitor, every, every part of that computer, and you knew all there was to know about it, could you tell me anything about its behavior? And, and, and the answer, of course, is no, because that is determined by the software. See, if I look at the computer architecture, what I have inside the box, there is somewhere in there a central processing unit. That's the actual electronics that manipulates information according to some kind of language. And there's also some electronics that allow you to communicate with it, what we call input and output, that connects it to a keyboard or a monitor or what have you. The central processing unit has available to it a memory. And it can put things in the memory and pull things out of the memory as it needs it. In the memory, of course, are data, lists of, uh, lists of people or whatever. But it also in the memory is what we call the programs, the software. What makes the computer something different than simply a very complex adding machine is that in the memory is a program that the computer can modify. The fact that the computer can modify its own program is what differentiates it from just a super adding machine. There are all kinds of complicated machines that have built through the years, that, like knitting machines and stuff, that would follow a fixed program. That's not what we're talking about. This is what many people call the von Neumann architecture, where the computer has in its memory the program it's following, but there are ways by which that computer can alter that memory. It can learn and, and do other interesting things. Well, what I want to do is talk a little bit. Most of us wouldn't have any exposure to what the soft, what, how is that software organized. Well, let me just take a look. Let's talk briefly about the software architecture. Inside that software thing, the, the primary thing is a master program, classically called the operating system, that manages the computer for you, because you don't really want to do that for lots of reasons. The operating system includes a user interface where the computer can make itself look to you in such a way that you're comfortable with. For some, it can look like an Apple computer, it can look like a, a PC, or it can look like a, 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 a other kind. So the point is there's different, some interfaces are very simple for a naive user, some interfaces are very sophisticated for the more sophisticated. But it can adopt a style, a presentation to you that we call the user interface. So inside the operating system, there's also a super program that manages the memory. You don't really want it, you don't really care where a person's name physically is located you go by a logical address, the computer's put it someplace conveniently. If you use it a lot, it'll move it to a more convenient place for you. You don't care about that. All you care about is for it, it is more capable at managing the memory than you would be. So it manages that memory, and inside that memory, of course, are not just one, but maybe several application programs that can be running simultaneously. The reason I get into all this, you, and all this, by the way, is in, the way you get it, is in machine language. You can use the benefit of all of this, but you can't change it significantly. That's why you can go to a computer store and buy someone's proprietary software and get the benefit of using it, but you can't change it or discover the secrets that are inside it. Why? Because it's all in machine language in the first place, and it's all embedded inside of programs which are embedded inside of programs. It, takes a, it would take an incredible amount of, of uh, 
insight to get into the kernel, into the guts of it. You see, you can't, from the outs, you can't tell much about the software by x-raying the computer. You follow me? That's what I'm trying to say. Now you say, Chuck, what's this got to do with us? Well, see, in the first place, the field of, as I look out here and at the audience here, my frustration is that I can't see you. I can see the temporary residences that you're in. Because the real you, the real you, isn't physical in the first place. You can call it soul or spirit, give it what labels you like, that's vocabulary. The real you is resident inside a temporary hardware environment. I can remember vividly, since I, I travel a lot, and I also have a, a pretty tight publishing schedule, I travel, I depend heavily on a laptop as I travel. And for several years, I traveled with this, one of the early laptops. It finally died. It finally just uh, got, <laughs> from all the abuse of travel, it finally died. And I was in big trouble until some friends of the ministry, recognizing my predicament, treated me as a gift to a top-of-the-line, latest at the time, supercomputer, super laptop. And I'll never forget that day when I got it. I opened it up and I loaded it with all my favorite tools, my favorite word processors, my favorite Bible program, whatever, all these things that I've grown dependent upon. And they all came up and ran recognizably, comfortably, except there were a couple of interesting changes. They ran over 100 times faster than I was used to. And they were in full color. I'll never forget that. And I was blown away. And the reason I bring this up is I want to share with you out here in the audience, you too are heading for an upgrade. The real you is recognizable, it's personal, it won't change in a sense, It'll, uh, and, and uh, yet uh, you're heading for an upgrade. And uh, now the reason I want to get into this a little bit, there's some software, has, you, you, the real you is software, not hardware. Well, software, of course, is, includes self-modifying codes. It's generated from high-level languages down to the machine code in the, in the in computer world, which means its architecture cannot be inferred from the outside. If I buy a program, I can learn very limited things about how it's internally organized by running it, because I only can observe its external behavior. Same thing with you. This, the only way I can find out how the software is organized is to get the designer's manual. And this is the reason that the field of psychology is doomed to frustration, because it's attempting to understand your architecture from your external behavior. There's some other issues. Software has no mass. What do I mean by that? See, it can be, software being translated to the airwaves. I can have a little antenna here and I can operate my computer wirelessly. Software, as well as information, travels through the airway. It has no mass, in intrinsic mass. Now, see, if I took a diskette, you see I hold up a little red diskette here. You've all seen a diskette. Um, if I put a blank diskette, diskette on a postal scale, it'll weigh about seven-tenths of an ounce. Okay. If I spend hundreds of dollars and load that diskette with over a million bytes of software and put it on a postal scale, it'll weigh what? Seven-tenths of an ounce. See, that software has no mass. It's like a light switch that's on or off. It's a one or a zero. It doesn't change the weight of the light switch. There's no mass to the software. It's information that's, that's mass-free. So software has no mass. Now, why am I emphasizing that? We just learned a little while ago that time is a physical property. The real you is software, not hardware. The real you has no mass. Now, it may be resident, and like in my case, in a little too much mass. <laughs> but the intrinsic me is mass-free, which means that the real me is eternal, whether I'm saved or not. That's the problem. Now, we talk about the body, soul, and spirit. Physical death is when the body and body is separated from the soul. The soul and the spirit can be separated, and that's what they call a second death in the scripture. And the soul will be is united with another body at the resurrection. And there's resurrection for the unsaved as well as the saved, which is leads us to okay, what happens next? I want to talk before we leave this topic and get ready for the next session. I want to leave one other idea with you that's kind of provocative. And now I want to talk a little bit more about the physics of immortality. Frank J. Tipler is a professor of mathematical physics at Tulane University. He's one of these guys, brilliant guys, that's an expert in cosmology, astrophysics, information sciences. He's not a believer. He's, a, he's one of these typical 
Very brilliant, atheistic professors. He undertook a project to try to reconcile what we think we know about the Big Bang, as they call it, which is a group of models of how a thing started, or they think this thing started, with the ultimate heat death of the universe. There's two different schools of thought about, and she's trying to put these together into one comprehensive model. And, as he, and using just the most advanced and sophisticated methods in physics, exactly the way that a physicist tries to determine, say, the properties of an electron. Using these tools, he discovered, he made two discoveries that shocked him. The first, as he got into this project and tried to put this all together, he feels he discovered proof of the existence of God. And when he, he says that in, in terms of the Judeo-Christian concept of God. Now you say, you may say, gee, that's no surprise. You know, a lot of, a lot of bright guys have discovered God. That's, you know, no kidding, Dick Tracy, you know. And I usually equip anybody with a, you know, anybody that's discovered God is, it's a, it's a result of a miracle of the Holy Spirit. If you got a PhD, it's even a bigger miracle, okay. But, uh, but the second discovery he made really startled many. He also now believes, because of a study, he's talking about a study of physics, not the Bible or anything. Sort of he also believes that every human being who ever lived will be resurrected from the dead. And he concludes that from just what we think we understand about physics itself. So he published a book called The Physics of Immortality. I don't recommend the book for a certain number of reasons. First of all, you have to really have an appetite for differential equations if you're into that. But even so, you can learn more about the subject from the most important chapter in the Bible than from his book. What's the most important chapter in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 15, according to Paul. Because if you don't have that, you have nothing. And uh, so, the physics of immortality. Well, that's what comes next then. Okay, then the question is, okay, given all this background of what we think we know about reality, what happens when we die? What does that mean? And is there really a hell? And what will heaven be like? And how do we prepare ourselves for that? And with this, this first session was a backgrounder to, make, to get into that one, which we'll take up in the next session.